and gentlemen, no matter their race, creed, religion, or gender. The poor are the most vulnerable, exploited, and oppressed group in the world, and have been since the dawn of civilization. We believe on side proposition that taxation is one of the most pernicious extensions of this oppression, and we are extremely proud to do away with it completely on our side of the house. Before I talk about a model, refutation, and then constructive, I'd like to talk to you about what we're going to prove to you on our side of the house today. First of all, we are going to prove that the very notion of taxing the poor is unjust in and of itself, independent of any consideration of benefits that are marginal on one side or the other. But second of all, we are going to tackle the issue of why not taxing the poor is better for them in at least the vast majority of cases and how the status quo hurts them by taxing. What we want by way of model is the following. We are going to implement a heavy progressive tax in all countries and the most wealthy people in society that like go is based on your bracket of income, and we would not charge any taxes whatsoever on the poor. So income tax, sales tax, property tax, utilities tax, capital gains tax, not that they would have that, but we would just throw that in there. Okay. My points, first of all, the idea of how it's principally unjustified. By the way, uh, is this a point of clarification? Yeah. Sure. Progressive tax actually means that you are still taxing the poor, but by a little means that you are taxing actually the no, no, poor. No, no, so no. No taxation them. on the poor, but when it comes to everyone else in society, would increase progressively. That's the model. Okay. Why this is principally unjust. First of all, we'd like to point out that side opposition has to have this debate in the real world. They cannot can make their policy contingent on like, we don't want to talk about bad governments who are bad to the poor, we don't want to talk about places where the poor are victimized. This is in the real world, they have to be able to depend this policy on a global scale tomorrow, right? Okay. Now, I'd like to talk about the first point under this idea of principle on justification, about how this is taxation without representation, okay? The poor, by and large, vote the least of any single group in society by nature, right? Either because they don't think the government will serve them, either because they don't think that the policies will affect them, but also because in many cases they are actively excluded from it, such as places where voting cards require money in order to acquire, in places where you need a fixed like piece of property that you've owned for more than a certain period of time in order to get a voter ID, in places where the polling station is so far from your home that you don't have the transportation or the time to even go vote to begin with. We'd say for a lot of minority groups that are also the poorest in society, not only do they suffer from things like gerrymandering in democratic societies, but also just have fewer rights categorically. So even if they can vote, in a lot of cases they just don't have the same rights as other people. Furthermore, we think in many cases, governments aren't under the control of the poor anyways, right? In cases where the government is controlled by the military, like what happens if that becomes a situation in Turkey over the couple, following couple of weeks, right? It's worth noting that the poor serve in the military but don't have any control over it. When governments are bought by corporations and the rich through forms of lobbying, right? In, form, in, in places where governments are controlled by the church, where the poor don't have control over that either, these systems of governments, governance aren't always in the hands of the poor, which in and of itself makes taxing them a form of theft because you're taking money from them without representing them like you should. The second idea then, how government policies actively hurt the poor. The most prime example of this is the prison system where a lot of poor people commit crimes because they are poor out of socioeconomic disadvantage, whether this is petty theft, whether this is tax evasion, and then the government locks them behind bars for it in a lot of cases because the government isn't paying attention to their substance, right? We think this is downright autocratic and, has, uh, and cannot justify taxation. In the case of wars, where the poor finance huge amounts of money for wars, and then in other countries, like they draft the poor to go fight them, and then the poor never end up seeing the benefit. This has been the case of many wars throughout history. And then when that money becomes too big, the government implements austerity measures that doesn't take away money from the richest in society, but takes away money from welfare programs that benefit the poor. Finally, in the case of education in schools, the poor are usually the most likely to be suspended or expelled because of high crime rates and the lack of police protection because Sir. of poor education and socioeconomic. I'll take in a second. Advancement in general. Go ahead. Uh, don't you think that is a bit um, unrealistic? Are you saying that a kid of five years old is going to start doing crimes in school just because he uh, is considered to be poor? Okay, but the reality is the poor commit more crime in a lot of cases than the wealthiest in society because they live in the most disadvantaged conditions. And if the government doesn't do anything about that, but then takes away their education, we think that that's really bad. 
Finally, so like the reason that this point matters right, is because independent of whether or not these existing status quo harms change on either side of the house, and independent of whether or not like the poorest tax money has been used to create benefits, they need to show us why the government has the principal right to take money from the most vulnerable people in society if in the status quo so many governments don't help them out. We think that is a principally flagrant idea. Second of all, on to how we actually benefit the poor. To understand this argument within context, I'd like to explain the pain pleasure principle. Because the side opposition is going to tell you that like when we, you know, the poor stop paying money, then like all of a sudden the government's going to be bankrupt. That's rather silly, right? In a lot of cases, the poor don't make up the biggest part of the revenue share. But why is this not a contradiction on our side? Because for every dollar that you don't tax the poor, that dollar means a lot less to the government than it does to the poor. This is because of like existing standards of socioeconomic conditions, like the consumer price index that determines whether or not you're able to afford groceries. Things like the poverty line, where if you're above it, you have a, a disproportionately better life than someone who is just below it, who might have to make regular decisions of whether they get shelter, or whether they get food, or whether or not they can pay for college and be successful and clothing. So when we don't tax the poor, that small amount of money they get back is actually really, really beneficial for them compared to the cost to the government. Okay. Furthermore, like just on a separate note, we think it is rather counterproductive to tax the poor in a lot of cases, right? In a lot of countries like India, for example, where the poor, in the case of sweatshops, make very little money, the government still taxes them. But then they expect the regional governments to then take that money and redistribute it in the form of ends that they're supposed to use. Aside from all the money that gets lost in corruption, we think it's rather silly to take money from the poor and then spend it on welfare programs to give it back to them, right? We think that that's really silly. We think the poor are better able to spend money in ways they need it in order to address their specific concerns. It's the classic example of why a lot of people in, let's say, the South United States say, why am I getting all these food stamps? I have food, but I can't afford diapers, so the government isn't giving me what I need. But even in the case where there is no taxation on the poor, right, by the way, like I should probably clarify this, we're talking about the poor in society as those who are below the poverty line, those who make minimum wage, the bottom 15% of the economic uh, part of society. I should have mentioned that earlier in my bad. But even in the case where the poor aren't taxed for minimum wage, other taxes on them still matter. They still pay property tax, they still pay utility tax, they still pay like uh, sales tax when they go um, shopping, right? Why is this better for the poor categorically when we eliminate tax? We think this creates a demand side benefit to society that benefits businesses and benefits the poor. So, why do tax cuts on the poor work versus the rich, just so you have a better understanding of it? Because there's this kind of trickle-down fallacy that if we cut taxes on the rich, that the rich are going to start spending more money and employing more people. The difference is the rich already have a lot of their basic needs and luxury met, so they're going to use that money and invest it in things like assets, invest it in things like stocks, and invest in other countries. Whereas the poor are systematically deprived of basic things they need, so that little money they get left directly goes into injecting businesses and con consumer and producers that provide them with those ends. Which means that the poor will be able to get out of poverty by being able to get more products and not paying tax on them, and businesses will make more money because of the fact that they have more income. Overall, we are extremely proud to propose. Thank you very much. Thank the first proposition speaker for his speech. Um, for the timekeeper, can you keep stomping to after 8.20? Thanks, I just prefer it. Um, and I welcome the first opposition speaker to start the case for her side.
Ladies and gentlemen, today we are dealing with a cyber position that doesn't actually understand their stance on not actually taxing the poor, and it doesn't actually understand the fact that the poor, uh, that the, the fact that the social contract implies that the poor have a duty to the state, and the state has a duty to the poor. And that's what I'm going to extend through all my case. But before, uh, before that, first of all, I'm going to explain uh, very clearly our stance, what we support, what we don't support, what our burden is, and what the first principles of this debate actually are. Uh, second of all, I'm going to have three points of rebuttal I'm going to prove to you today that they actually didn't assume their stance, and they actually didn't uh, prove to you today why the poor actually don't have to pay any, any tax. They actually uh, uh, talked so much about those progressive tax, but this is actually happening in our world, because I'm going to explain to you today that what we support is a progressive tax that is an income tax system uh, that is set up in order for people with higher income to pay a high tax, uh, a high income tax, and people with a uh, low income to pay a low income tax. We are not talking today about a world with extreme poverty. We are not talking to be today about people who live in tents and so on and uh, live on a dollar a day. So we are talking about people who are actually can afford this uh, this tax, which is in, uh, in in accord with their uh, actually income. Also, we think that collecting taxes is a duty of the state because all those taxes, uh, all those taxes, are actually return to the citizens by services they provide, by fa by facilities that they completely ignore in their speech today. Also, what we don't support is the flat tax that is actually happening in Romania, where all those people have to pay the same flat tax, the same income tax, and we think that is actually not fair, and we are not supporting that at all. But in Europe, in the most Western countries, also in the U in the U.S., in the New Zealand, in New Zealand, in Australia, this actually progressive tax is happening and this is what we are supporting today and uh, uh, we are clearly acknowledging the fact that they didn't understand that they had to not support any kind of tax for the poor. We think that we are actually reducing inequality but by other means and our burden is to prove that no taxing the poor at all is immoral, inefficient and that um, Applying a progressive tax, the tax according to our definition is actually the best solution, and not just not taxing the poor. And now moving on to the uh, to my uh, point of rebuttal. First of all, they talk to us how, uh, how poor people are vulnerable and so exploited, and we think that they totally dramatize the, the, the situation because actually those poor are living in a society where they are using facilities, and the, uh, therefore they have to pay for those facilities they use. It's like going to a restaurant, uh, wanting to eat something and then not paying because you say, well, yes, I'm actually a little bit poorer than the people I'm eating with at the table, and we think that this is not uh, um, what they had to support today. Also. Um, Second point of rebuttal, uh, they told you today how this is unjust. Well, we, st uh, we say that the social contract is enough for this, uh, this actually to be just, and the progressive tax that they actually didn't understand today is enough for those people who to have to pay something to the state in order to get those facilities. This is also said to you today that people don't have to control something. Well, it, well, actually we don't have to control something like prisons and government in order to benefit from the society, we just have to um, benefit for what the uh, society is giving to us. And third of all, they told you to you today that we are going to say that government, uh, no, no, sure, uh, no, uh, sorry, that uh, by uh, those poor people are actually the ones who commit the most crimes and so on. And we think that, first of all, this is a fake assumption, and they didn't explain to us why the, the poor people are actually the ones who commit the most crimes. This is actually totally false, and they, we are waiting for an explanation. And second of all, even if you accept this fact, actually, by not taxing them, we provide them a deterrent for them to improve their lives and they're making mm, mm, uh, less crimes that they're actually making in today's debate. And uh, last point of rebuttal that um, uh, the government, the money is beneficial to the poor, we see that is false for them too because those facilities are not only used by the rest of the society but also for them. And so not the government is going to get back up uh, because we are going to apply a progressive test but those poor people are actually going to get less and less benefits because they are also not going to to benefit by those facilities who are going to get worse in a state where the people are not paying the tax that they should pay. Um, also, we don't want to cut taxes on the rich. We don't all, we all just want to take the poor. And this was the, actually the last point they talked about. And we didn't understand the fact that uh, they said that uh, uh, we don't want we will want to tax only the rich. This is not a valid point. Before I move on to the next chapter, yes, please. So even if it's true that the poor do use a lot of services that are just ameliorative in nature, what's the point of giving them welfare because they're poor and then taking that money away from them later? Are you ameliorating anyone? 
no, no, thank you. We are not going. To, we are going to give them the money because they are poor. Only one of the limited period, such as uh, because we want for them to improve their lives and we want for them later to get a job and so on. This is actually how we provide them an incentive to get a job and move on with their lives. That's why we are going to give them a social welfare and don't actually understand your uh, QI. Thank you. Now moving on to my arguments. First of all, why abolishing taxes for the poor is immoral. Second of all, why will it not lead to a more equal society? And third of all, we, uh, the second speaker of the proposition is going to talk to you today about how progressive tax is a better measure and uh, we also want to accept the fact that uh, progressive tax in our world, not progressive tax in their world, progressive tax in the world where we are taxing the poor in order to be in accord with their actual income. So uh, in my first argument, I'm going to have three stakeholders of the motion. First of all, to the state. Second of all, to the society. And third of all, for the poor, in order to prove to you today that it's immoral to all the stakeholders of the motion. First of all, to the state. Well, we are not talking today about extreme poverty, as I said to you before. We are talking about people who still use the facility of the state. We are talking about people who will actually want to go to public hospitals. They want to go to public universities. They want to go to the in the parks that are publicly funded by the state. And how it is not morally fair at the principal level for them to use all those facilities without paying the tax income that actually all the other people and all the other members of the society are going to pay. And the state is um, doing all those things in order to get something back, in order to improve those facilities they are going to also help the uh, whole society. Now, thank you. Second of all, to the society. We will say that the person, um, uh, those persons are, are, are still going to, um, it is fair for someone not to not to pay because he's living excluded by the state because living with people and interacting with them is enough for you to have a duty to all the citizens you are living with. It's not the other friend, the other people you are going to live with and interact with are not going to be okay with the fact that you are not still going to pay the same same tax that they are going to pay. It's uh, not fair for them to pay the burden of the whole society. For example, in the U.S. elections, candidates based, based their campaign on the fact that they will raise income tax to improve facilities such as healthcare and education, and how they will do that in the world. And this is what actually helped them because they prove to the society that facilities are going to get better, so the whole society is going to get better. And on a utilitarian level, it's not correct to infringe the right of a minority in order to have a majority, and that's why we win this debate. And for the poor, the facilities are going to get worse, and that's how we can have both of them, we can have both no tax and also best facilities. And second of all, moving to no equal um, no equal society, first of all, about the deterrent they are actually providing. Uh, this deterrent for this. This is a big deterrent for the poor people to, in order to improve their own lives. You're still going to be okay with earning a small sum of money because you think, yes, I'm not going to have to pay any sum of money to the state, so I'm not going actually to have to do something in order to improve my life. I'm going to stay with the same society. Society is not fulfilling his duty to the state or duty to the state to, to give you the, this incentive to improve your life, to earn a, uh, better, to give, to have a better job and to improve your current situation and to have uh, more money and so on. And those people are going to be okay with their situation and going to, uh, to want to stay in the same situation and this is not something that we support. The big percentage of people who are poor will, will stay poor in the long term and that is going to lead to a very clear social distinction between the social class. It will actually eliminate the middle class and it will lead to a worse integration in society because I proven today all those points, their case falls in our sense. <coughs> I thank the first opposition speaker for her remarks and welcome the second speaker in the proposition to continue the case for esteem.
thank you. To paraphrase Mahatma Gandhi, a greatness of a society is measured by how it treats its most vulnerable members. And that's exactly why, on side proposition, we are so proud to oppose a side that wants to deprive these most vulnerable members of a basic quality of life that we think that everyone should be entitled to. All because of a flawed conception of social contract theory. Okay, so in my speech, I want to do a couple of things. Uh, just like Armin said in his roadmap, I'm going to do some refutation followed by some constructive. I'm going to do three points of refutation. Firstly, what is their burden on their side of the house? Secondly, what, are they, what is the principle in this debate? And thirdly, let's talk about pragmatic benefits. I'm going to then forward our third argument about how this changes incentives. So first, let's talk about this first point of rebuttal. What is the burden on their side of the house? What they said was, basically, we're not talking about really, really extreme poverty. Like, we're still, like, we don't necessarily have to tax them. No, we think they still have to talk about the status quo, where you still do tax the most poor of the poor. We think they're incredibly, like, they're sidestepping their burden completely. No, thank you. The next thing that they said under here was that, well, progressive taxation still involves, you know, um, like, um, taxing the poor a little bit, so we're sidestepping our burden. Okay, and regardless of what the name means, we're basically saying we'll take progressive taxation, we won't tax the poor at all, and we'll just, imp like, increase everyone else's tax rates except for the poor. I think that was just, like, a mechanistic quibble. Let's talk about the principle here, right? The main thing that they had under here, no thank you, was about the social contract theory. Three responses. First of all, I never opted into the social contract theory. We don't necessarily think this is a legitimate uh, thing. We don't necessarily think just because I happen to be born in a state, uh, just because I'm poor, I never consented to have my rights taken away. I never consented to the theft that Armin talked about in his point. More importantly, if you have taxation without representation, that's a theft that I never Point's consented there. to. They can't just like you know brush that away because you know a social contract theory. The second reason why it's not legitimate is because I can't opt out of the theory. I can't opt out of that thing. Especially if I'm poor, I can't exactly move out of a country and go to another country, right? So if you can't opt in and you can't opt out, I don't know why it's a legitimate choice and you can't bind people to that thing. But the second response that we have is about the principle of taxation. You don't tax people because of social contract. You tax people in order, there's a very pragmatic reason, because you want to uphold the state and you want to keep the state in a good condition. Right? And given what Ar Armin already told you about the fact why the poor aren't the most significant tax base, and you can easily be made up for, like, uh, like the, uh, especially with the pleasure and pay principle, we don't think that was particularly um, convincing. The third response that we have is that in the status quo, there's already a precedent for this kind of thing. Uh, in many countries, we don't give income tax. Yes, no, thank you. We don't charge income tax for like minimum wage jobs. The reason why we don't do that is because we recognize that these people are already gaining so little money. So it's unjust to take away the little money that they have. We don't think there's a moral distinction between like not charging someone who's gaining minimum wage income tax and not charging them like sales tax or property tax. That's a distinction yes, that we want to hear in the next speech. No, thank you. The next thing that they told you under the principle was about the state, that the poor use services and they have to pay for those services. Our first response is that this is like inconsistent, because if, it, if anything, the poor are people who use these services the most. So if their logic is, you know, if you use the services, you should pay proportionally, then they should pay the most for those services, right? So we don't think that's consistent, that's contradictory. Yes, sir. Their no, thank you. But the reason why we give these people services is because we recognize that they were disenfranchised in the past and you want to make up for those uh, that past disenfranchisement, right? That's why we give unemployment benefits to those individuals. So we don't think that because the, because the state ignored these people's problems Sir. in the past, they have a moral obligation to be uh, making up for that kind of thing. And that's independent of taxes. Why, sir? No, thank you. Okay. I want to talk about pragmatic benefits. The first thing I want to deal with here is the POI that they said. Basically, they're like, well, they're like, if you're a child who's five years old, you are you really going to go to crime because you know you're just poor? As Armin said, the poor are statistically more likely to go to crime, and like because of their economic circumstances, economic crimes such as theft and drug dealing. And this is rampant in impoverished communities, where actually, as they said, kids are more likely and they're pressured to drop out of school because they think that you know underfunded education can't really get them anything. So they're forced to go to forced to go to things like drug dealing because they think that kind of thing will be a lot more profitable. What happens with this resolution, as I'm going to explain in my constructive, you give incentives to invest more of these things that help the poor a lot more. Okay. Please, sir. Yeah, sure. You do realize that in your world, it's not like they're going to have thousands of dollars in plus once you apply this motion. 
they're still going to be considered kind of poor, so they could still very much, very well do drugs and do crimes that you keep talking about. Okay, this is a comparative debate. On our side of the house, like, okay, on their side of the house, you give them welfare and then you take money away from them. On our side of the house, you give them welfare and you don't take money away from them. So I would garner on our side of the house, like the comparative is just a lot better. And I'm going to prove to you in my constructive why the give, the stuff that you give to the poor in terms of money, capital, and services is actually wrong. So why is that the case? I have three subpoints under this argument. This changes the incentives. So my first subpoint is about the status quo. For example, in many countries such as South Africa and Myanmar, a really good example would be South Africa here. What they do is that they keep the rich, uh, like well-off people in society in gated communities, and they keep poor and impoverished people outside of those communities. What they do, what this allows them to do, is it allows them to brush the problems of the poor under the rug and pretend that they don't exist. That means that they have very little incentive to help these individuals. We don't even think this is applicable, we think this is applicable to all countries, like not just South Africa. It's just much easier to ignore the most vulnerable people in society. And what uh, people, governments often do, they just don't care about these individuals. Second sub what happens with this motion? What happens is that you change the incentives of the government. This is for two reasons. The first reason is because of the public sector. The public sector wants more money because they can big, you know, uh, give more infrastructure, and that's just a really good thing. And that's why uh, bureaucracies tend to support higher tax rates because it allows them to, you know, um, like build more infrastructure because they have more money to do that kind of thing. What happens now? With this motion, the public sector now has a stake in getting the poor out of poverty because now they know that they can't just bank on the poor to give them the kind of money. They have an incentive to get these people out of poverty because they know that if they do so, they can get a direct cash benefit from that kind of thing that is in their best interest to do so. The second reason is because we think that the rich and the middle class are also very incentivized to do this. Because as we talked about, there's a progressive taxation. And once more poor people are got, got, um, taken out of poverty, these people are going to be taxed comparatively less. So they're more likely to lobby the government to make those kind of changes because it's in their best benefit to do so. What's the tangible on the ground impact of this kind of thing? First of all, you get more things like employment programs more investment in education and crime reduction, because those are things that actually help getting poor people out of poverty and that can't just brush these concerns under the rug. The third uh, impact I'd like to talk about, this is my third subpoint, is that you get more political enfranchisement. In many, in many uh, countries, the poor people don't want to vote because they think that the government is their enemy. The government has just been subjugating them for all this time. So whatever they vote for is just kind of pointless because they're, whatever the government does, the government's just going to push them under the rug. They're never ever going to get so upward social mobility. With this motion, they're more likely to vote because the government is no longer their enemy because they think that no matter who they vote for, they think they're going, the government has a stake in making sure that they're actually going to get benefits. Politicians are more likely to appeal for this voter base because now they're actually a voter base, whereas on their side of the house, they aren't. Uh, and once again, they're more likely to get policies that are better for these individuals. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we need to help the most vulnerable in our society. And it's on that basis that we are so proud to go for this. I thank the second proposition speaker for his remarks and welcome the second speaker in the opposition.
feel sorry for Team Proposition today because they refuse to um, to uh, to prove to us their actual burden and what actually um, why it's actually moral for these uh, people that are poor to have facilities uh, to not pay taxes to the state. Moreover, they didn't prove why actually for the poor it would be so much better to ha to have them plus fifty or one hundred uh, one hundred dollars uh, from the state. We see, I, I also feel sorry for them because they contradicted themselves twice and I'm going to uh, point them out firstly. Um, and they also did not understand what actually progressive tax is because progressive taxation is not just um, dividing your society in two, dividing, dividing it in poor and you know, the ones that can actually pay to the state and then allow, uh, applying progressive taxation to that other half of the society. Okay, starting with contradiction. Um, I offered a, uh, a POI where I uh, asked them, you know, you see, if you actually do drug dealing, it's not like you, um, when you're going to get uh, $100 in plus, you're not going to want to use drug dealing again, because it's not like you're going to start being a millionaire and be so happy with your life. And then they said, no, of course not, but you see, they're actually going to be reduced, re uh, the money from the, um, from the rich is going to re be reduced, re distributed into the welfare and so on into the facilities that they're going to use which are going to be better. Okay, and the first speaker said that the poor do not actually want that. The first speaker said that they actually want the money in their pockets to be able to pay for clothes rather than, um, you know, having better schools or better hospitals, which is a contradiction between the two speakers. Um, Yes, also, and the uh, second contradiction that um, the second speaker made was, you see, how it's actually going to be a uh, more investment to the state and they're going to have more money to pay. But the model said that for every dollar that the poor doesn't pay, the rich will pay. So no, it's not going to be more investment, it's going to be equal investment. So that means that in your world, there's not going to be necessarily better facilities, but rather the society will stay the same because that's what their model said at first. Rather in our world, it's going to be more, uh, more investment, but I'm going to get into that um, in my argument. Okay. They contradicted our argument about social, the social contract, and well, their argument was that you see, they, when they, if you're born in America, it doesn't mean that they give the consent to the American government uh, to pay these taxes and whatever. It's, there isn't such thing as a social contract. Okay, when your kid will start going to school in America, you will you actually uh, do give your consent, no thank you, to the American government. But moreover, when if you have an accident on the street with a car and you're sent to the hospital where you're going to be treated off of the American government's money, you do give your consent. It's, it's, uh, we, we, you don't have to sign on paper that, okay, I'm gonna give, we're going to sign this no thank you social contract with the American government. We think that is something uh, indirect and it's something very well understood by itself. Okay, um, then they based their case a lot about these uh, loads of assumptions that you see the poor don't go to vote because they're mad at the government because they're poor. Um, they actually do crimes just because they're poor. We think these are assumptions that are not necessarily true. Um, uh, no, thank you. And even if they were true, in your world they would still remain the same because, as I've said, it's not like they're going to start turning millionaires overnight. Um, if tomorrow I'm going to have fifty dollars in plus in my pocket, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to keep on doing drug dealing, or if, I'm, if that I'm not going to want to do drug dealing. Um, okay, and um, no, thank you. Um, the third argument bends on the incentive and how you see uh, the government will have this incentive of actually helping the poor because it's gonna um, the money from the poor is actually in the long term going to come to the government and blah blah blah. We think that first off, that is already the government's incentive. It's not like the government is ruling with the idea that I do not want to help the poor. We think that that is why actually we sustain a progressive taxation for the poor themselves. We, we Of course we say that maybe they're taxed too much, but we don't think they should be taxed nothing. That is what we want today. We think that, of course, maybe the rich should be taxed more than the poor, but the poor should not be no thank you taxed at all. And that was explained through our argument about why it's immoral, which was not that much. the only answer we received. You see, because they are poor, they have to not pay the taxes because that helps them. But they haven't proven to us why it's actually a uh, moral no thank you to the state. Um, for them to not pay anything. They haven't proven to us why it's actually moral to the citizens themselves for them to have to carry the burden of the, of the ones that actually don't pay anything to the state. Also, they haven't responded to our argument about deterrent, about how these people will not want um, to be a part of that uh, higher class just because they're going to have to pay more taxes um, in your world. But uh, whereas if they're going to be poor, you see they're not going to not going to pay taxes. And also, they haven't really defined what poor means. Is the poor does poor mean that they're going to have more than the um, Minimum wage? Lower than the minimum wage? No. Because what we can see is that they actually define these poor people as extremely poor, that have $10 in their pocket and live on their street. Which besides, if you have $10 in your pocket and you live on the street, you don't pay taxes at all. Um, 
Okay. Um, yes, please. So even if you're right, and let's say there's no abusive governments in the world, the fact that the number of services I use is often based on whether my parents had money or whether they didn't have money, thank that's you, what we you. arbitrary. First of all, we never said that the government abuses of anyone. Secondly, if you want to, if you're going to have a, um, an operation because you had an accident in the street, you do not pay the hospital to have that operation. You ha you go in there, and the, the government, the hospital has the duty to help you uh, in such a state. Whereas if you're poor and you don't pay anything, well, you don't pay to the government for the facility that you just use, and you haven't proven to us why that is actually moral, which should have been your uh, burden from the first point. No, thank you. So now, uh, my argument about why progressive tax, including the uh, including the lower class, uh, is actually better. Because first of all, we think it's moral. We agree that it's uh, that they have a problem. That is why we think that okay, we're going to tax the less, uh, the poor less, and uh, <coughs> the rich more. But we don't think it's moral to not pay, to not tax them at all. Um, and that was kind of already talked about in the, for the previous speaker. But now I'm going to provide it's actually because it reduces economic inequality. It reduces the whole idea about how uh, economic equality um, uh, occurs when uh, resources in a society are distributed unevenly. And that really doesn't help them because if you're just going to have $50 in plus types, that is not like it's such a big deal and you're going to have such a different life tomorrow. Um, and yeah. Um, Secondly, it also uh, provides higher overall level, levels of revenue in our world, because in their world, as I've said, they contradict themselves. For one dollar of the rich is one dollar of the poor that doesn't pay. So actually, they're going to be in the same state that we are today, but rather the poor are not going to pay. In our world, we're going to help the poor not pay as much as the rich, not pay as much as they pay today, but still pay. And we're going to tax the rich more, which is going to actually provide higher levels of revenue, which is actually going to um, help to the greater good of the society. And thirdly, we're going to reduce this, these kind of social classes that we have. Because in their world, it actually it is accentuated. We're going to have, you see, this part of the, uh, the people don't pay anything because they're poor. And then this part of the people have to pay more because, you see, they cannot afford it for themselves. That wasn't answered by team government today. And we think in our world, it's not going to be like that. Everyone is going to be taxed according to their, um, according to their uh, how much money they actually have, which is not going to basically group the society in two worlds of the ones that can pay and the ones that can, but rather every individual will be seen as a person who, can, who has some kind of income and pays a tax proportionately with how much he actually earns. And that, that way we can uh, reduce these social classes that are uh, exist in the society, we can have higher, higher overall levels of revenue, and we can actually reduce inequality. Because in their world, the world will just stay the same, but we would have two social classes, the one that cannot pay and the ones that can pay, which was not answered. Thank you. I thank the speaker for her remarks and welcome the third speaker in proposition to close the main section of this team's case. I think that I just want to flag something before I get into my speech today. It's a little bit disturbing that side opposition hasn't had much constructive material and hasn't had a single specific point talking about the benefits to the poor. I think that's something that you should wait in this decision. Because ultimately, my partner did a great job outlining at the start of the speech why we should care about the poor in this debate, largely because that's who we're trying to help in this debate. And so we find it very disturbing that they haven't really talked about the poor in their speech today, at least not in any substantive, constructive way. So that aside, what am I going to be doing in my speech today? I'm going to give you two themes. First of all, talking about what is moral. Second of all, talking about what helps the poor. And in that, before that, I just want to address two things about in miscellaneous kind of ideas. 
So first of all, that kind of calls on this contradiction, because we're saying like we don't like welfare apparently, but at the same time we love welfare and we want them keeping their money. That's just not true. We'd support things like the welfare system as a, and a UBI, as well as just letting the poor keep their money. We think that that's not mutually exclusive. It's no contradiction there. The second thing they tell us is that we're kind of like not taking our burden, and that really what we should be argue, what they want to argue for is that like sure the poor are paying too much, but that doesn't mean that we should be paying nothing, so we haven't really addressed our burden. Here's what I want to tell you. First of all, our entire principled case deals exactly with why the poor shouldn't be paying anything. But second of all, all of our practical benefits only get better when they pay nothing. So I think that we really have met our burden, something they've been calling us on. Let's put that to bed right now. So with that in mind, let me get into my two things today. I got two questions. Before that. What is moral? What is uh what helps the poor before that? Sure. Okay, yeah, we said what will help the poor. We said about the social classes which will not exist. We said that my, the, the, uh, there will be higher levels of revenue to the state, which of course are gonna help the okay. poor. Thank you. So that's largely talking about society, and even at that point, we spent a long time talking about society, but I'll address that when I get into my second theme. I have that down there, I promise. Apart from that, let's talk about immoral, like what is moral, first of all. What have they said? They say it's completely immoral for the poor to be paying, like not to be paying money, why? First of all, they say that paying taxes is you pay taxes because you get a return in services. No, we tell you that's not the purpose of taxes. The reason you pay taxes is because you're giving your money to someone who can better exercise it to, for you, right? That's why we can start a government. To the extent that the government becomes inefficient in that mechanism, or comes downright abuses after you've proven, you shouldn't be paying taxes anymore. Since that is the case, don't pay taxes. The second thing we tell you is that actually what this is, is that another purpose of taxation is basically just to maintain the state. To the extent that we can prove that the state will still exist and survive in our world, we think that you still shouldn't be paying taxes. We find it ideal if you don't pay taxes in general because we can exist without it. I think we're fine on our side of the house on that. But finally, on their side of the house, they're also arguing for people not paying taxes in the lowest like socioeconomic groups. So we find it a bit of a contradiction that they spend all their time telling us why every single person must pay taxes, but then the people that but use the most services, they don't actually want paying taxes. That's a bit of a contradiction if we're talking contradictions. Okay, what's the second thing they tell us? They tell us this idea about the social contract. I think they did a good job with the social contract analysis on telling you why it's just not true. I just want to add in one thing dealing with the rebuilding, which basically said if you use services like healthcare, you consent. That is the definition of duress, because they're literally saying you choose between your life or paying taxes. That's just not a contract in any sense of the word. Okay, let's deal with the next thing. They say that there's benefits, so you must pay. We've just done a good job telling you why there aren't really benefits in the first place, so no, you shouldn't pay even by that logic. The final thing they tell you is the utilitarian principle. So basically, because you're benefiting the rest of the society, so the middle class and the rich, you as a poor person should pay. That's just not a good principle to put, put again. Because they're literally saying, we're fine exploiting the poor in any circumstance <coughs> because it benefits the rest of the society. That just nice. leads right into our principle point. We think that on that, even in their own analysis, that favors our side, not theirs. But furthermore, in a utilitarian principle, we'd still give benefits to the poor and the rest of society because you're getting the poor out of poverty on our side. So even if you want to argue you utilitarianism over categorically being wrong to exploit the poor. We still win Sorry. on that. Uh, before I go next. Okay, just give me a simple explicit reason why it's so moral for them to use the hospital that they do not pay anything for it. Thank you. I think I just did because what we're saying is you're forcing them to choose between their life or paying for taxes. That in of itself is immoral, but furthermore what we tell you is that we think that it's perfectly fine even if it was immoral for you to use the healthcare services because you're being exploited in so many other ways. We put it on the balance of immorality, we still went out in that case. Okay, let's do with what we said under the principle Please, idea. Sir. No, thank you. So what did we tell you? Our party gives you brilliant analysis on the principle, and all they really do is assert that it's immoral not to tax. I doubt with any of the substantive they put under that, but let's go into a little bit more reasons. So first of all, I doubt with it. Second of all, it's assertion. Let me add in a little bit more here, because I want to talk to you about a new aspect as to why it's totally immoral for their side to be correct. Uh, excuse me, uh, but like for their side. Uh, so we, I want to talk to you about hereditary wealth. So I think that the general way that wealth happens right now is that people have already gotten wealth from past ways because they were already rich going into that. That gave them certain benefits and they become a lot more rich as a result of this. And the poor are poor because of the past and they're staying poor because of that. So what we tell you is on our side of the house, we actually make acknowledgments of that and try and fix the past injustices that have been put on people, whereas their side, of the, whereas their side just kind of ignores it. We 
think that if you want to talk morality, it's probably when you're making up for past injustices, something our side does. So if you want to talk why the poor shouldn't pay for healthcare, it's because they already did that in the past, making other people rich in the first place. Okay, let's, I think I've dealt with morality. We've won on that. I think that in itself should win the case, but let's talk about the print or like practical benefits. What do we hear from them? No, thank you. They talk to you largely about society, and this is something I flagged as problematic because they don't have any specific analysis on the poor. But let's go into what they've said so far. The first thing they say is because you live together, you must pay in society. That just kind of feeds back to the morality point. I dealt with that, use that as analysis, I think. The second thing is they say that people will be angry, so there's going to be a, back, a lot of backlash. First of all, they never told us why that's bad. I think on our side of the house, if we're serving morality and we're serving practical benefits to the poor, I think we're fine with a bunch of people being angry. But second of all, when are people not angry at the poor? Like they're constantly being demonized right now for welfare services. Why do we think this is going to make any substantive difference in the first place? So that goes with society. And the final thing they tell you under this idea is this sort of idea about like how like there's going to be a division of the classes. How is that not already existing in the first place? If anything, we're just going to reduce that thing when we get more poor people out of being poor. We don't think that there's any tangible harm to it, even if that was the case anyway, because it already exists in society. Okay, let's deal with what we've told you under practical benefits. So the first thing we hear a lot about is my partner talks to you about how each dollar means so much more to the poor and how this is so much more beneficial. No response to that. They kind of straw man us with their drugs kind of like analysis. We took, we took care of that. The second thing he talks to you about is how it's actually counterproductive for us to be taking away money from the poor then giving it back, especially in places where there's a lot of corruption. That's just ridiculous. <coughs> You're just reducing the amount of benefit you could ever do, assuming you wanted to do benefit. Basically, in all of the analysis, and of course, they didn't even respond to his part point about demand side benefit and how trickle down effect just doesn't work. What did they tell you? They said that we're bankrupting the government. So what do we say to that? First of all, we think that we can make up for it by taxing the rich and the middle, like the upper middle class more. We don't think that we're going to kill society in this first place. But we're all there, But furthermore, they say even if you don't bankrupt it, you're just going to have less services. Why do you think that that's not going to be really problematic? Well, first of all, we tell you that the poor are actually going to be more efficient with their money. I point to Brazil, where we actually gave poor people money, and they were able to spend it on things like refrigerators and like washing machines. So no government would ever spend money on that. But think about why that might actually be helpful, because you can keep food safe, you can get rid of disease or dirty stuff. That seems like a very helpful thing. So we think in terms of pure efficiency, we think that poor people can probably effectively use money. But second of all, if you really are decreasing services, like the US budget spends a fourth of its money on military, maybe take a little bit of money away from that and spend it on other stuff. We think that you can reallocate resources. Apart from that, the final thing we talked to you about is the rest of my partner's point about incentives. No response to that. Because we're benefiting the poor, because we are correct morally, because we make up for past injustices, current injustices, we are so proud to propose. I thank the third proposition speaker for his remarks and welcome the third speaker in the opposition to close the main section of this debate. Okay, so at the end of this debate, team proposition has failed to respond us to three big questions that we continuously put them to this debate. First of all, how their measure doesn't separate society into social classes. 
Second of all, how it will not be a deterrent. And third of all, why it's not moral to the state and to the society to uh, not tax, uh, to not tax the <coughs> And also, at the end of this debate, the proposition fails to demonstrate us how this, uh, how their measure is um, is uh, beneficial for the three big stakeholders: the state, the society, and the poor people. While on uh, the other side of the house, team opposition, we showed you how our measurement, how implementing progressive. Uh, pro progressive progressive ta taxes to all of the people from the society is beneficial for uh, is beneficial for the society because it's a moral uh, it's a moral measurement and because it's it's reducing inequality at the level of society because this we will not draw a harsh line between two social classes between two uh, between poor people and between uh, wealthy people. Uh, now, moving on, I have uh, three points of rebuttal that I'm going to talk about today, and then I'm going to present the uh, three classes I identified in this debate. But, first of all, um, talking about rebuttal. Uh, they told us how poor people are more likely to commit crime, and uh, because of the um, environment they come from. And even if we accept that, even if it's not right, but even if we accept that poor people are more likely to commit crime uh, now in the actual um, in the actual society, we are telling you, you are telling you today that between uh, that uh, because that drawing a harsh line between these two social classes classes that are are part are part from the society, wealthy people versus poor people, this will only accentuate this fact, and this will only make these poor people commit more crimes because they will be seen. No, thank you. At the level of society, like poor people, and this this statute of there will be accentuated because they will be people who, can, who can't afford to pay taxes and who don't want to pay taxes and who are privi uh, privileged, privileged. Second of all, they told us how um, they told us how uh, the government will have more money if we imp uh, if we implement this motion, but we're telling you that it's not like that. Why it's not like that? Because the government will have the exact amount, same amount of money we, uh, which will come to them, but it will be uh, taken uh, from different uh, places. It will, be, it will be taken just from wealthy people and not for poor, pe poor people. And that will actually uh, this harsh line we are, uh, we, are, one second, we are making between these two categories of people. Yes, please. Okay, explain why these small token payments, the poor given to services that they take more out of anyways, Thank is so principally important when that money could be used more effectively by the people themselves. Thank you. Uh, it's more efficient it's because we are taking First of all, because we are taking the same amount of money, and we are taking uh, for, uh, we are taking from poor people and from wealthy people, and that is that is uh, sending a message to society. That is sending a message that these poor people can afford their living, want to afford their living, want to be part of society, and don't need to be uh, don't need to be uh, uh, held. Do not be cared by the other part of the society, by the wealthy people. And uh, third of all, they haven't. Um, no, thank you. They haven't. Be, they haven't presented any benefits for the poor, but the. Uh, uh, be, uh, they just said that these poor people, no, thank you, won't pay uh, taxes, and that is uh, benefiting for is beneficial for them. But we are telling you, like I said repeatedly in my speech, because I really want to accentuate this idea, we are drawing this harsh line be between two classes. And we are making them feel, um, we are telling to them, you are, poor, uh, you are poor people, you can't afford the living, they have to pay for you. This is what the proposition uh, proposes to propose today. To make this, no thank you, to accentuate this statue of them, uh, of, um, them in the society, and that is what we don't support today because we think that we shouldn't tell them this. We, we should tell them uh, that you can uh, make your own living, you can do this, you can pay, and we are we are not only imposing them to pay the same taxes as wealthy people because we know they can't afford that. We are telling them that they should pay a tax to the state. That is, uh, that is, uh, um, um, that, th that they can afford that. Uh, um, that that is um, uh, special for the for the for their uh, amount of money they they have. No thank you. Now moving on to clashes. The three big clashes I identified today are: um, is not taxing poor people at all efficient? Second of all, inequality at the level of society. And third of all, the correlation between facilities you use and the tax you give for paying them. Um, but before I get into them, yes please. 
So if you're so worried that the poor are going to be victimized when they get social assistance, why aren't you supporting the kind of flat tax that you proposed in your first speech? Thank you. We didn't uh, propose we didn't propose flat tax. We didn't propose that all of the people in the society should pay the uh, should pay the same amount. We proposed progressive taxes, but for all of the people in the society, not just for uh, not just for people who are not considered by them poor. Um, moving on to my next clash about uh, nothing about moving on to my first clash about is not the tax setting for people at all efficient. We are telling you at the, the end of this debate that is not it is not efficient to don't taxate the poor people at all. And why? Because if we if um, if they don't pay any tax to the state, they will be considered the part of the society that can't afford and that do, doesn't want to afford. No, thank you. Um, doesn't want to pay these taxes to the state. And second of all, this will be this deterrent uh, in society because they will they will they won't be motivated to work if the government uh, uh, if the government uh, pay taxes for them. Let's say no, if the wealthy people pay taxes for them, they won't be motivated to work and to make money and to pay those taxes. They will be uh, they. Um, they want to be motivated, and I want to give an example here for social aid. Social aid is given to people by the state for a limited period of, or period of time, and not for their whole life. And why? Uh, that is because they want to make them motivated. They give them the debt, uh, the debt social aid for a limited period of time in order for them to, uh, in order to motivate them, and in order to make them earn their own money, and not to be, uh, no thank you, not be supported by other people in the society. Second of all, talking about inequality at the level of society. Um, uh, like I said, this will make a huge difference and this will draw a harsh line between the two classes of society, uh, between so, uh, wealthy people and between poor people. And that is going to, uh, that is going to, uh, they tell us how in, um, the, these people are going to be exploded even, even more on the future if we accept the fact that they are exploded now. By implementing this motion, they will be even more expo uh, exploded uh, on the future. And third of all, the correlation between facilities you use and the tax uh, you pay for them. We think that if you use facilities, you should pay for them. Because um, uh, it's like going to the cinema, watching a movie, and then saying, no, I'm a poor people, so I won't pay this. Or uh, using a taxi and then saying, no, I'm not going to pay this. And we think that that, this is, that is immoral because you use a facility, someone um, tries to uh, facilitate you all uh, the basic things you need, and then you refuse to pay for them, and we think today that that is immoral. And all of this being said, I beg you to oppose. I thank the speaker for remarks. Now we welcome the reply speakers, starting with the opposition. In this debate, we've told you about the social contract and about how this implies a duty of the citizens to the state and of the state to the citizens. And this argument still stands on our side because they didn't manage to prove to us today why those poor people don't have a duty to the society in the context of the society who is constantly helping them, in the, concept of the, in the context of the society who is currently giving them all the facilities that actually wealthy people also have. We are not saying today that, yes, we know that we can, they can, wealthy people can also afford private hospitals and private uh, schools and so on, but we are talking about the public service.
services that are available for everyone and also for the, those poor people. And they didn't manage to prove to us today why those people shouldn't, um, do, shouldn't do their duty to the state in a context where we are not talking about extreme poverty, we are not talking about people who can afford, can't afford actually to pay this amount of money. And in order for them to prove their own burden, they have to prove to us that to the two main big sta stakeholders of the motion, they are winning this debate. And they failed to do them both. First of all, the poor people, which they extend, highlighted so much to their speeches. And I'm going to show to you why they didn't manage to prove to us today that they are benefiting them. Second of all, to the rest of the society. Now moving on to the poor that they talk so much about. They denied uh, the, the social contract agreement uh, agreement by saying only that they didn't consent to that. And we have several responses to that. First of all, that consent is unnecessary in the country, the um, lottery of birth and and uh, even if it was using the facilities of the state when you are getting bigger, using the facilities of the state even in the moment that you are born implies that uh, an implicit consent that doesn't, doesn't actually has to be written anywhere in so this point is also false. Also we told them today that they have a duty as they have a duty to pay their check on the restaurant as they have a duty to pay their check and what they uh, actually consume at any point and any concept of the or, or over. Moreover, we told you today that we don't want them classed into, into big classes of uh, wealthy people and poor people where they live this with, uh, where they, they constantly have to live with that and they constantly have to know that they are separated by, uh, from rich people with this harsh line. They didn't manage, manage to prove to us today how they are going to move on and how they are going to get over this harsh line that they are. Um, and, we, and moreover, we also want better facilities who are going to help the poor and we want to incentivize those people who are poor to make their life better. When it, when we can't do that. We can't incentivize the, those people to improve their lives if they, are, uh, if they uh, don't have to, uh, to pay something to the state. They are going to uh, stay in the same condition they, 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 because they are okay with the fact that they don't have to pay. So let me stay with the same condition I have now, in the same situation. I don't want to improve my life. I don't have to pay my duties. So I'm going to stay there in my own cage and move on with my life and this is not fair. And also, we told you for them, uh, we asked them in uh, many points, what's the correlation between being, being poor and being exploited? We are not talking here about slavery. We are not talking here about people who are actually exploited. We are talking about people who are poor. And th this big difference with, between people who are poor and people who are exploited has been uh, explained to us at any point of this debate. But moving second to the rest of the society that uh, we are also um, helping. Uh, they didn't talk to us today about the utilitarianism, about how are how is okay putting a number of people above the above the common good. How is okay taxing some people and not the, uh, taxing some people in the context of all having equal rights in the society? And at least that's what we want, what we support. With them. that's what we all should want from the state. And those facilities are going to get worse. And those facilities are going to get worse also for the rest of the society, also for the rest for the poor people. And that's what we win this debate also on this point. We win this debate on the point where we where we all can acknowledge the fact that we want better facilities for all those people in this debate. And it, we told you for them that it's fair not to pay something to the state only in the context where we are living on the top of the mountain, only in on the context where we are not using any kind of facility from the state and you have no interaction with the rest of people who are living in the state. And because I've proven you today that for the society as a whole it's better our measure, that, that also for the poor people it's better that this measure and the social contract still stands, we beg you to oppose. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to open by reminding you about what Adithia told you in the second speech about their stance. We thought that for side opposition to take a stance supporting progressive tax was rather weak, because in doing so, not only did they implicitly concede that there is a principled obligation to protect the most vulnerable in society, but they then hung their entire principled case on the difference between paying absolutely nothing to the government and paying a small token cost to the government because of some social contract that I didn't necessarily opt into. But let's say they're right. Okay. I want to talk about why, they, why we've won this debate under two things. First, the principle, and second, the benefit to the poor. 
Under this idea of the principle, side opposition said broadly, you use, you pay. And they brought the example of movie theaters, restaurants, what have you. Ali Khan showed you why those things were distinctly different from each other. Right? You don't need a cinema to live, you don't need a restaurant to live, but you do need services to live. And at the point where they can see that welfare is okay, so it's fine for the poor to use more than they pay back, they've implicitly conceded that it's okay for us to have amelioration to help the poor. This is what we've been arguing down the bench. But also, we've been talking to you about the past injustices that have been levied on the poor by not just specific bad governments, but all governments around the world, why institutional policies in and of themselves deprive the poor of their rights. <coughs> I talked about that in my constructive point. Adithya talked to you about that in his constructive point. We also said that you need to weigh the principles, because even if they're right, that the poor should be expected to pay a little bit, we're talking about the difference between the principle of helping the most disadvantaged in society and the principle of making up for abuse and the principle of that small token contribution you make. Given that they never showed you why the latter was more important than the former, I think by virtue of significance, our principle won that round. But finally, if we really want to talk about why the poor should pay absolutely no tax, it's for this reason. The poor in society, as I told you in my introduction, are victimized not just because of their socioeconomic class, but as we showed, because of their race, because of their gender, because of their religion. And at the point where the poor are systemically oppressed in ways that are categorically different from the rest of society, to even expect that they pay anything at all to their biggest oppression, oppressor is downright unfair. Now let's talk about why we help the poor. Side opposition told you that there really isn't much in it for them. What's 15 bucks going to do day to day? That is why in my point about, uh, about the benefits, I explained the pain-pleasure principle, about how, yes, that $15 doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of welfare programs or other things, but for that poor person on a day-to-day -day basis, that can actually make a really huge difference. We don't have to say that welfare programs are perfect in the status quo, which is exactly why we think if you just give them some of the cash back that you're taking from them, you'll allow them to fill in at least for the odds and ends by spending money on themselves. At the end of the day, this was bad because side opposition's whole point became hung on this issue that it wasn't as good for the poor because they acknowledged that amelioration is okay. And given that their only response was to say that it doesn't necessarily solve drug addiction and they assert that we don't make a link, even though we did, I think they didn't fulfill their burden in this case. We also told you, they also told you that there's going to be less money in the budget to spend, but I think we dealt with that, right? But furthermore, right, the issue is, when I raised this issue of counterproductivity, it was in recognizing the fact that, fine, the money that the poor contribute to the budget might be less, but given that they take more out of it to begin with, at the point where you can give them money so that because of the economics point of view, they won't necessarily have to use the system as much anymore, it actually results in a net reduction in the kind of cost that they're talking about. But finally, opposition said, what's their motivation to succeed if we just give them no money? As we told you down the bench, we thought it was rather sinister to say that the poor would rather enjoy their current status quo than work to get better jobs, work to get better lives, even if they're taxed a little more, considering that we think we provide that better and account for the obstacles that exist to the social um, ascension. We're extremely proud 